Ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker is Jacob Kaplan-Moss, uh, co-BDFL of Django, previously worked at World Online, where Django was invented. He's a noted speaker on Django, having keynoted DjangoCon US and Europe, and has presented at Python conferences around the world. Today, he's going to be talking about how to protect Python web applications against the OWASP top 10 attacks. Please welcome Jacob Kaplan-Moss. All right, hi everybody. So um, just very briefly about me, um, so you know who I am and uh, that I'm at least minimally qualified to talk about web security. Um, so I am the co-BDFL of Django. Um, I was one of the people who worked at the journal world where Django was invented and I've been um, involved uh, in the project ever since. Uh, and lately um, I've taken a new job as the director of security at Heroku. Um, so if you are, are, are a Heroku user or want to talk about Heroku, come, come talk to me. And that's pretty much the last I'm going to say about my day job. Um, so let's talk about the web. Um, the web is, is really, really scary. Um, unfortunately, unfortunately, when we, when we talk about security engineering, the most basic mistakes can end up being catastrophic. Um, someone likened it to if you were building a bridge and the choice of a bolt, if you used a bolt that was a few centimeters too short, could cause the entire bridge to collapse. That's often what security engineering can feel like. And, and that's rather, that's rather d terrible. It, it makes developing web applications scary. Um, as you learn more about just how insecure and just how terrible the web is for keeping your stuff protected, it, it, can, be really, it can be really frightening. Um, luckily, we have Python. And in particular, we have some fantastic Python web frameworks. Um, I'm going to talk about what I think of as sort of the primary Python web frameworks right now, uh, Pyramid, Flask, and Django. Um, I think most people doing web development in Python are using one of these frameworks, and if you're not, I think you should. Um, obviously, I know the most about Django because I'm deep, most deeply involved in it. Um, I know the second most about Flask. I use it fairly regularly. Um, I know the least about Pyramid. Most of what I'm presenting about Pyramid comes from reading documentation and trying things out, although I've never built a through to production application in Pyramid, only toys. So that'll give you an idea of where my, where my knowledge holes might be. I think I've gotten everything right, and I've run it by a few people to check, but if I am wrong, please correct me. Okay, so, so what is this OWASP top 10, um, the title mentioned? Um, so the OWASP is the Open Web um, Application Security Program. It's a consortium of security professionals, of web security professionals, who work to put together uh, open, um, free, uh, in both senses, uh, information about web security. And they publish a number of, of, of documents and resources from, um, from uh, penetration testing tutorial, which is actually really fun and, and great to work through, um, to methodologies and resources you can use to evaluate your own applications and, and your own security issues um, to this, which is what they call the top 10. They do a um, roughly bi-yearly survey. Every couple of years, they do a survey of web vulnerabilities, reported vulnerabilities in web applications, and try to look at what the most common issues are and, and rank them. Um, now, like every one of these sort of top 10 lists, there are, there are quibbles. People who do this for a living might say, oh, I would really put CSRF a lot higher than number eight. Um, or, you know, I'm not sure I would include um, insecure direct object references so high. That's, that's fine. There, you know, we, reasonable people can disagree about the top 10. I, I find this is a good launching point for trying to evaluate um, where we are, where our tools are. Um, so the goal of this talk is twofold. For those who are new to web security, I want to introduce briefly what each of these points are, explain in the broadest strokes what each of them is and, and what a vulnerability looks like and what the results would be. 
and explain to you how you can use one of these great frameworks to protect against this vulnerability. For those who are a little more experienced with Python or maybe contributors to frameworks, um, I want to kind of use this talk as a way of giving us collectively a scorecard. Um, not, not Django specifically, not Flask specifically, but, but the Python web world. How do we, the Python community, do against this top 10? I'm going to come back at the end and kind of look at everything we've seen and, and give us a scorecard. And I think it identifies some areas that we have to work. So uh, I'm speaking to two different audiences here. If you're new to this stuff, I hope to give you some practical advice to make sure that the applications you develop are as secure as you can. Um, I hope to show you what will be easy and what will be hard. And for those of you who actually work on these tools, I want you to pay special attention when I talk about what's hard, because that's where we should be focusing our effort and that's where we should be um, trying to do better. So let's dive in. So the top vulnerability, and it has been every year that OWASP has published their list, is injection. Um, if you're an XKCD fan, you're probably familiar with uh, Little Bobby Tables. Um, and what, what SQL injection is, so if you're, if you're laughing now, you understand this bug. Um, but for those who don't, I'll, I'll try to explain it a little bit. Um, all of my slides, all of my examples use Flask because it's the smallest, it's uh, the easiest to, to fit on a slide. There's a very specific type of development, slide-driven development, where you need to write code that's small enough to fit on a conference slide. Flask is perfect for slide-driven development. So let's imagine we were writing a, a banking site and we want to display a list of transactions, of your transactions. So we might write a view like this. Um, we get the um, we get the username from a get variable, uh, we do a SQL statement, um, and we render the transactions that we get from the SQL statement. So let, let's think about what this might do. Let's walk through how, how this, uh, this might work. So I could, uh, I could visit a URL in my browser like get transactions, question mark, user equals Jacob, right? And we could imagine the application would generate this URL. It would just be like your transactions, I'd click on it. So if that happens, um, it gets interpolated into the string, and so we get a nice SQL statement select from transactions where user equals Jacob. No problem, there are all my transactions. Okay, but what if I pass in an argument like this? Um, and that's some gobbledygook there because of URL encoding, but that's basically the string quote or one equals one. So if I pass that in, when, once I do the string interpolation, my SQL statement ends up like this, select from transactions where user equals blank or one equals one. And since one always equals one, I get every single transaction. So now all of a sudden, instead of logged in users just seeing their transactions, now they see everyone's transactions. So this is data leakage via SQL injection. So that's, that's bad, right? Everyone's transactions, everyone's private data. Um, but it gets worse. Uh, if I pass in a string like this, and I'll let you figure out exactly how the encoding is going on there, um, I end up with a SQL statement that looks like select star from transactions where user equals empty string, semicolon, delete from transactions. That's really not good. There's a, a, an interesting type of attack that, um, that uh, Black Hats have started doing lately. Well, they will, they will discover a data leakage vulnerability, and they will download all of your data. And then they will use that same vulnerability to delete all your data and essentially hold your data hostage. They'll ask you for $50,000 in return for returning your own data to you. And if you didn't have good backups, and let's face it, if you are writing an application that's vulnerable to SQL injection, the chances that you also don't have good backups are reasonably high. You end up having to shell out money to the very people who broke into your systems. Not, not fun. Now this is sort of the most simple form of SQL injection. We're using, it, we're using a get header here. It's clear that the data is coming from the user. Um, you know, this is the very basic. In practice, something like this wouldn't necessarily uh, have to come necessarily from direct data from the browser. A lot of times SQL injection comes from what's called stored injection. So when you sign up for the bank and it asks for your username, 
that's where you might put quote or one equals one, hence little bobby tables. Um, so we, you might think, oh, the username is safe because it comes from my own database, but you have to actually trace back through the string of where the data comes from. So again, broad strokes. If you want to know more, there's lots of resources out there, starting with OWASP about SQL injection. But let's move on to what you can do about this, because although this is the most dangerous vulnerability, the one most likely to really, really hurt if you've got it, it's also the easiest to defend against in Python. Basically, if you're using Python and you're using web stuff, please use an ORM. I know that this is somewhat controversial. There's this whole, like, what's, what's the line, ORMs are the Vietnam of computer science. Um, and and there, there are good reasons to use raw SQL. But for most of your day-to-day -day work, if you use an ORM, you're, among the other benefits you get, you are completely protected against these problems. So Django has the Django DB models, the model backend, and in both Flask and Pyramid, um, the default seems to be SQL Alchemy. There are a few other ORMs in the, um, in the Python world. Uh, Peewee is one written by a friend of mine. There's Storm out of Canonical. All of the ones I've looked at have a really good story around SQL injection. They properly escape all their parameters. They use what are called bind parameters in the database. The story here is really, really good for us as a community. If you must write SQL by hand, there's one rule you, you have to know. It's absolutely critical, and that's never treat your SQL query as a string. Um, the database API takes two parameters, a query and a list of parameters. As long as you always pass in your parameters in that second item as a second argument, you'll be safe because that will use what are called bind parameters. They'll be sent to the database separately. Your, your query won't be dealt with as a string and you won't be vulnerable to this. If you ever see code like this where you're using string interpolation or the uh, addition operator to add strings together. If you ever see code like that, that's probably a point where you have a SQL injection vulnerability. So a really good rule of thumb is anytime you have to use raw SQL anywhere in your web code, to look at that code really carefully and make sure you're using bind parameters. If you follow that simple rule, and if you use an ORM where possible, you will be protected against this attack, which is nice. Now, the last time I gave this talk, um, the first question someone asked was, well, I'm using NoSQL, so I'm safe, right? I don't have to worry about SQL injection because I'm safe. Um, well, this guy in particular is using Mongo, so I went and looked at, how the, at the MongoDB documentation, and it says, uh, if you're using any of these operations, you must exercise care to prevent users from submitting malicious JavaScript. So if you're using Mongo, you don't need where clauses, right? I mean, clearly that's not a, something you use. Yeah, unfortunately, um, you're safe from SQL injection because the, of the no SQL, but you're not safe from, from JavaScript injection. Uh, so again, if you're using something like MongoDB, you probably want to be using a, it's not an ORM, what would they call it, a, a ODM, Object Document Mapper. Um, there are several good ones for Python. The ones I've evaluated seem to be pretty good. I would imagine that the other NoSQL frameworks have similar tools that protect you against this. As a general rule, um, this phrase, you must exercise care, that's like a red flag to security professionals because history has told us that no matter how smart you think you are, no matter how, how smart I think I am, no matter how much I know about this, no matter how good I'm supposed to be at these things, I'm going to get it wrong. If, you, if, if the, the approach to security is you must exercise care, you will forget one, one time. So the real rule about almost all of this, the, the theme that's going to be running through these is you have to have a system. If you have a systematic way of solving these, instead of get it right every single time, you'll do okay. All right, injection. Number two, uh, broken authentication and session management. This is actually an umbrella for really a ton of, um, a ton of different types of vulnerabilities ranging from improper storage of credentials, which I'll talk about actually in a later point, to um, bad password recovery functions, um, to various forms of session security. Um, there's all sorts of different attacks on sessions from 
phishing attacks to stealing people's sessions to session forging to session fixation. There's just this whole class of vulnerabilities that basically resolve around, uh, revolve around um, hijacking someone else's session. So even though you don't have their password, you can still sort of be logged in as, in as them. If you saw the buzz about Firesheep, Firesheep is a, a form of, um, of session, uh, a session attack. And for a long time, the response from a lot of people about session attacks were, um, uh, animation fail, were, oh, login, well, what this says is, this is someone at Dropbox a number of years ago saying, um, login's over SSL, so we're not vulnerable to session issues. Um, raise your hand if you think that's true. If you, if you put your login page uh, over SSL, you're not vulnerable to session stealing. Anyone believe this? Yes, we're doing our job, good. Um, yeah, unfortunately, that's not true. Um, there's no excuse. Your entire site should be behind SSL. If it's public, it should be SSL. You, yes, this costs more. SSL termination is, is CPU intensive, and you're going to require more resources. Um, but what are the costs of having your site compromised? Um, there really isn't an excuse for making sure that your entire site is, is SSL only. Flask and Django both have tools to actually enforce this. There's something called Flask SSLify, uh, which will force your site to use SSL and also use something called HSTS, which is an um, extension to SSL to provide an additional layer of security there. Um, Django has a tool called Django Secure, which I believe will be built into Django circa 1.7, which I'm pretty excited about. I was unable to find an equivalent for Pyramid, so uh, this is one of those points where either someone needs to tell me that I'm wrong or someone needs to build this. Um, both of these tools are really easy to use. You basically put a couple of lines of configuration and now your entire site will be forced, o only served over SSL. Um, they are good, use them. Uh, the other component of this is once your, once your site is secured behind SSL and, and man-in-the-middle attacks aren't feasible, um, you also have to make sure that your sessions themselves are secure. Uh, and there's actually quite a lot of complexity around session security. Uh, Django had a, a bug for a long time on, um, on uh, around the generation of the session key where if you, you could basically predict someone's session key. If you knew roughly when they were about to log in, you could actually log in within about a second window of when they logged in and get the same session key, um, which was a, related to us using an incorrect random number function on Windows. So this stuff, the, the, the tendrils of session security extend in a bunch of interesting directions. So the, the rule is basically you probably want to use an existing component, an existing framework that's thought about these things. Uh, Flask has this built in as, as flask.session. Django has it built in as Django contrib sessions. Pyramid has a built in session framework, which you should not use. It is not secure. The documentation calls this out um, and tells you to use Beaker instead, and you should pay attention to what the documentation said. Um, you should generally not store data in cookies directly, rather prefer to store them in the session. Um, and if you do so, all of these frameworks um, basically require a secret key to ensure that the session hasn't been tampered with in any way. Uh, if you leak that secret key, um, you know, you put it in a config file and check it into GitHub. Uh, if you leak that secret key, uh, your sessions are basically, um, should be considered insecure. Um, so yeah, don't put your secret key on GitHub. <laughs> Um, and finally, even though your secret key, even though your sessions are signed and secure, um, if you use one of these tools, um, you should probably consider the data to be uh, to be user generated, and hence be really careful about um, you know where you use it, be it in SQL queries or in templates. Um, it's not always session data can come from a variety of sources, but Generally, when you're writing a web app, session data has something to do with the user, and it's often influenceable by the logged in user. So as a good rule of thumb, assuming that session data is dangerous, um, it, it might not be, but it doesn't hurt you to assume so. So again, the theme we see is, you know, use, use a tool, don't, don't reinvent this stuff. 
And we'll see that again as we talk about cross-site scripting. So cross-site scripting is basically like the front end of version of SQL injection. It's all about sticking your arbitrary code into, this time, a web page, not a, um, not a SQL query. So we might imagine a, um, a view that looks like this, that says hello to um, a user. So if you visit say hi slash Jacob, it'll say hello, Jacob. So again, let's think about what might happen here. If we ask for say hi, Jacob, we get it's fine, hello, Jacob, great, our HTML comes through there. But what if we visit say hi and then a bunch of interesting data there? Well, then we get uh, hello and a script tag. And that script tag will run and could do anything from stealing your cookies to automatically friending people to et cetera, et cetera. It was a well-publicized XSS attack against MySpace um, years ago, although I said MySpace, so that implied years ago. Um, <clears throat> uh, Sammy's worm. Uh, someone by the name of Sammy found a XSS attack in MySpace that let him put a little bit of code on his profile page. And if you visited his profile page, that code would run in your browser, logged in as you, and would add that same, would friend Sammy, and then add that same code to your profile page. So if anyone visited your profile page, they would friend Sammy and then add the code to their page. And I think he managed to, to uh, friend like 90% of MySpace users. They actually found the bug because their, um, their friendship system slowed down as you friended more people. And he actually managed to bring their servers to their knees because he friended too many people. Um, <clears throat> so that's, that's what an XSS attack looks like in, in practice. Um, Again, just like SQL injection, although this attack can be pretty bad, it's easy to defend against. Uh, just use a template language that escapes HTML. Um, Django's template language does this, and uh, the quasi the quasi standard in the Flask pyramid world, um, Jinja, does this as well. Um, <clears throat> there, Python has many other template languages. Those that do not escape HTML are not suitable for use, use on the web, and don't use them. There are other ones that are useful for other types of tasks, but if they don't, um, automatically escaping HTML is a, is a prerequisite. And I know this because Django's template language originally didn't, and I resisted for over a year while people argued that um, secure by default was the only way to go, and I was finally convinced when, um, when Malcolm Tredinik uh, proceeded to systematically discover XSS attacks in every single site that I was responsible for, and sending me an email that had a description, and then, now are you convinced? About one a day for a week until I threw up my hands and said, okay, okay, I get the point. <laughs> so if you use a template language, if we rewrite our application to use a template language, now our template will automatically escape all of our script tags, and we'll just see that someone tried to XSS us with, without actually seeing the problem. So OWASP has this weird thing at number four, um, indirect direct object references. It actually took me a while to figure out what they meant by this. Um, so I actually kind of, they mean a bunch of things. Again, this is an umbrella term, but I'm going to hijack it for one particular thing um, and, and pretend that this is about bad URLs. Um, so let's imagine we have an app that lets people apply for a job. And we have a job application object, and we, and we, um, we store it in a database, and we've got a, we've got a page that users can go to, to like edit their job application, you know, preview it, whatever. So after you apply for a job, uh, it might send you an email that says, you know, thanks for applying. If you need to make changes, here's a link to your application. So I don't know about you, when I get a, a link like this, I mean, what do, you, what do you want to do when you see that link? <laughs> We're all programmers. We know, like, we see. That's, that's, an, that's an ID. We know what that is, and we want to know what, uh, what's next. Um, this is what OWASP means when they say insecure direct object references. You're using a, a direct reference to an object, something that's a transparent way of accessing that object, and we're not securing it in, a, in any way. So there's a variety of ways that you might um, that you might uh, solve this. Uh, one of the best ones is to basically use throwaway identifiers. So on the web, we often call these slugs. Um, it's sort of a little bit of an identifier in a URL. And so instead, that might end up generating, if we use a slug, we might end up generating a link that looks something like this. Um, you know, 
Jacob Kaplan Moss 2013. Though even this might not be the best approach, right? Because if I, if I wanted to know, if I knew that you were applying for a job, I might be able to still guess what a link like this might look like. So this still might not be, this might be better, but this might not be perfect. You might want to think about using something like a hash or a random number or some form of more opaque identifier anytime you're including it in a, in a, in a URL, presuming that URL needs to be um, private. And we'll come back to this uh, example in a little bit because there's more we could be, we could and should be doing around this type of, uh, this type of application. All right, so at number five, OWASP has security misconfiguration. And by that, they mean like you put, you know, insecure equals true in your settings file. Left debug mode on. Um, unfortunately, there, there's kind of no silver bullet here, right? Like if you, if you have the switches turned in the wrong direction, there, there kind of isn't a lot that framework authors can do to make sure that, that you are that you are secure. I mean, we can offer secure defaults, we can offer documentation, but unfortunately for you as developers, this is kind of one of the areas where we, we fall down a little bit. There's no, there's not really a good way of making sure that when you're ready for production, all your, all your knobs are turned to the right settings. Um, there's been a little bit of, you know, work around documenting this. Both Flask and Django have pretty good security checklists. Um, I wasn't able to find one for Pyramid, unfortunately. There wasn't a really good, like, these are the things to do before you go into production that I was able to find. Um, the aforementioned Django Secure um, actually goes a little bit farther and has a command you can run, um, currently called Check Secure, that will look for some common mistakes that you might might have made in your application. It will check that you're SSL only, it will check that you're using a proper session storage, it'll check that you've got HSTS enabled, it'll kind of do a bunch of uh, checklist things. Um, we like this idea so much, we're um, expanding it and including it in Django, hopefully. Um, this doesn't exist for Flask or Pyramid, so, uh, you know, Sprint starting Monday. Um, we would be, I, I would be thrilled, Django Secure is not my code, it's uh, Carl's code, but I would be thrilled, and I'm pretty sure he'd be thrilled too if you ripped it off and, and, and uh, uh, stole it for uh, one of these other frameworks. <laughs> um, just one other thing, please, please turn off debug mode. Um, <laughs> Django serves a very specific string at the bottom of debug pages. You're seeing this page because debug equals true. Uh, if you do a Google search for that exact string, you find so much stuff. <laughs> um, uh, when RDO launched, they, they, the day they launched and announced on TechCrunch and, and, and et cetera, they had debug turned on. <laughs> and so if you managed to find an error in their site, you could see all of their configuration settings and their database connection string and yeah. So um, <laughs> turn stuff off. Um, in Flask, it's app.debug. In Django, it's in the settings file debug. Uh, Pyramid has actually a few different debug settings. Um, there's a debug all, which is probably the one that you want to turn off. But um, if you've turned individual flags on and off, then you have to turn those individual flags off. All right, sensitive data exposure. This is all about um, not, not exposing not exposing data that needs to be sensitive. So frickin' mailman, every month, sends your, e your password to you in plain text over email. And this, in this, of course, means that they're storing your password in plain text. So if anyone manages to get access to a mailman installation, there's your password. I hope you didn't use it on any other sites. Um, the biggest thing to talk about for, uh, when we talk about sensitive data is, is password storage. Um, use bcrypt. Use bcrypt. Anyone think you should use anything else than bcrypt? You're wrong. Use bcrypt. If you are enough of an expert to be able to explain what the differences between bcrypt and PDK DF2 are, if you could implement either of these algorithms, then you may choose a different algorithm. Otherwise, you should use bcrypt. Um, and, I, and I'm not, and I don't. bcrypt is what I use. Luckily, it's very easy in all, in, in all of our frameworks. Um, Django has sort of quasi support for bcrypt, but you have to install Python bcrypt. And in Flask and Pyramid, you can use a, a library called Passlib to do this correctly. 
It's important to note that even if you follow these instructions, you should still assume that your passwords are crackable given enough determination and enough resources and enough time. So properly stored passwords are not a panacea. You still need to make sure that your database is as secure as you can make it and not publicly accessible and not open to SQL injection and et cetera, et cetera. But if you use bcrypt, um, you'll at least be, you know, head and shoulders among above mailman. <laughs> okay. Missing access control. Um, yeah, access control is really hard, right? Like, it, it, when you have com complicated security rules, they're very hard to make sure that they're applied directly. Um, remember our, uh, our job application from a few slides ago? Well, there was kind of still a problem with this because even if I, if I could guess that number or that slug or that identifier, I could access someone else's application. And this is a, you know, this is a reasonably common thing, right? We, we think that we've got a URL and we say, okay, this URL is, you know, unguessable. Um, and then it turns out we're wrong. Django had a vulnerability a while back around uh, the password reset, um, the, the password reset view. Uh, it would generate a link in an email that had sort of a hash, and the assumption was that hash wasn't guessable, so that you couldn't sort of construct a reset link for someone else's password. Yeah, as it turned out, we were wrong about it not being guessable. Um, so we probably, you know, we needed some other forms of control around there. Uh, in that particular case, we couldn't add login around it because the person had forgotten their password. But um, for something like this, you know, you probably need to be adding login on top of it. So for example, you might check that the applicant on this application is the same as the current user browsing the site. Make sure that users can only view their, their own applications. Um, access control is kind of one of those things that none of these frameworks can, um, can kind of do out of the box for you. Um, Dylan's keynote at um, DjangoCon AU yesterday was really interesting. He talked about one of the big benefits of CMSs over frameworks is that CMSs actually do really handle access control in a, in a sort of careful and holistic way. Uh, frameworks kind of leave it up to you to write it yourself. Um, all of these libraries provide you the build, uh, the, the, these frameworks provide you the, the building blocks you need to implement um, secure to implement access control, but it's really a good idea to sort of have your own access control layer that you build on top of whatever the framework provides for you so that you can reason about your access control a little more, a little more holistically. Um, most successful applications I've seen end up with some sort of form of abstraction that comes down to a function that says, does, does user X have access to resource Y and then occasionally to perform action Z. Um, you usually come down to that, those sorts of questions about users and access and occasionally um, actions. Um, yeah. CSRF, cross-site request forgery. This one's a little bit hard to explain, um, although it's actually, I'm surprised to see it all the way down at eight because I see it in real world applications all the time. Um, so let's imagine that you've got a, a, a stock trading site and uh, you've got a list of, you know, a table of stocks and next to each one you want to have a little link to, to sell the stock, right? So you click sell and then the stock, the stock gets sold and some money comes back into your account. Um, well, if you built a site like this, I might send out an email to people that I suspect of having a account on your, on your site that looks something like this. Hey, look, you've won an iPad. Click here to claim your iPad. Well, notice that link. It goes to yourserver.com slash stock slash sell. Well, that's the same as where this link, where this form goes to. And now anyone who clicks on this link to try to get their free iPad actually ends up selling their stock. Or deleting their account, or launching nuclear weapons, whatever that link happened to be. Um, so you might, you might be saying at this point, yeah, yeah, but I, you know, I'm a web developer. I know that get is meant to be an impotent and that I should be using post for all of my, all of my forms. I'm protected, right? I can use post. Yeah, not so much. I can still send out a link that looks something like this, where I just use a form and a button. And CSS will let me style this however I want. This can still look like a link. 
There's even another insidious, there's a more insidious form of an atta attack like this called clickjacking, where you actually style this form button to be uh, invisible and position it over a flash game. So when someone clicks to play the game, it actually triggers a link, a form submission onto the other site. So this is the cross-site part of cross-site request forgery. We are tricking a user into performing an action as if they were on someone else's site. And your site can't tell the difference between this form submission. Because HTTP is stateless, we have no way of knowing whether that user was previously on the site. So I've just hinted at the solution, right? We have to introduce some concept of state. We have to make sure that we know that this user, this form submission is actually from the form we served. You could think about this in, in a physical um, in a physical analogy as when we, when we hand someone a form to fill out, we, we make a note of the, of the ID number on that form, and when we get the form back from the, the user, we, we check that the ID number matches what we gave out to them, and that way we know that they're returning the actual document that we handed to them. We can do the same in HTTP. We can have a, an input in our form, um, some arbitrary token containing some some value, some particular string, and we can check on each form submission that the token that comes back is the same as the token that went out. Now, the details of generating this token are quite subtle. Um, I, I believe Django, I believe we iterated three times on our CSRF framework before we got it right. Was it four? Three to four times. Um, it's quite subtle. It's difficult to do. Uh, we we illustrated the why you kind of want to use someone else's implementation rather than inventing your own. Um, so yeah, that's the um, that's the uh, answer basically in your own application is let someone else do the heavy lifting for you. Um, Flask actually has a couple of uh, of good options. There's there's Flask CSRF which just implements the CSRF parts. Um, but if you're using WF, WTF forms, which most people seem to do, there's actually an extension that combines both WTF forms and Flask and Flask CSRF to give you CSRF protected forms in Flask, which is the best thing to use. That, that's what I use. I think it's great. This is built into Django. Um, you can't turn it off. It's sort of built into Pyramid, but it's not on. You have to sort of manually turn it on and like do some things yourself. So if you're using Pyramid, see the documentation, follow the instructions, make sure you've turned this on. And just like with sessions, the security of your CSRF token depends on your secret key. So if you leak your secret key, you're now open to CSRF attack. So guard that key. Guard that key with your life. So if you were uh, here for the previous talk, you heard me ask a question based around this, this, uh, this point. Um, OWASP identifies uh, using components with vulnerabilities at number nine. And this is a big problem. This is probably the place where we fall down the hardest. So you can ask pip. You can say, hey, pip, what's outdated? Pip list dash dash outdated. And it'll tell me I'm using Django 1.5, and there is 1.5.1 available. And it'll tell me I'm using Raven 146, and there's a 333 available. It'll tell me all these things. Which of these represent compatible bug fixes, incompatible bug fixes, security releases, big major sky is falling security releases? You know, for all you know, Django 151 might have fixed a SQL injection attack. This gives you nothing. This tells you stuff's out of date. But then it basically says, yeah, good luck with that. Um, this is really a big problem. Staying up to date as things change is really, really hard. We don't have the infrastructure. Uh, uh, we don't have the bits, the bits in place to make this easy. Um, you, all of these answers are not very good. You need a good test suite so that you can update your dependencies often and test them. Um, when I really get my act together, what I like to do is have a CI server that every time it runs, updates to the latest version of everything. So I, I'm basically continuously integrating my test suite against newer versions of my dependencies and what I have pinned in production. But the problem is people release backwards incompatible stuff all the time, and then things fail, and, and having a schedule and knowing when it's a security issue versus not, it's really, really hard. You can follow mailing lists. There's a service called Bundle Scout, which you gotta, gotta pay for, and they supposedly will tell you about security releases, but they seem, they seem to not do a good job telling the difference. So 
Watch this space. This is one of the reasons I took a job at Heroku. <laughs> All right, the last issue is about unvalidated redirects. And uh, this is basically a rather esoteric issue. This was the, the topic of our most recent security release. And basically, under certain circumstances, you could fake a host header and force a email to come out that looks like it comes from your site. In fact, it does come from your site. Sorry, it actually comes from your site, but it links over to someone else's site. This is a, a component of a... Uh, of a form of phishing attack, a targeted phishing attack, sometimes called spear phishing. And unfortunately, we all fail here. Um, all of our frameworks built in redirect functions have no facility for checking that the redirects are safe. That is that they redirect back to our site or a site under our control rather than someone else's site. So let's, um, let's sum up, how did we do? Um, injection, nailed it. Authentication and session management, we're doing pretty, a pretty good job. There's a bit of work you have to do individually, but, but the frameworks give you all the things you need. XSS, nailed it. Direct object references, eh, it's kind of up to you. The frameworks give you good routing tools, so you should be able to do a good job, but we don't do that great a job telling you to do that, so mixed. Not so good about security configuration. Pretty good about sensitive data exposure. Uh, access control, this is a lot of work. I don't know that we'll ever be able to do an excellent job here. CSRF, nailed it. Components with vulnerabilities, total fail. Absolute fail here. We are not doing a good job. And redirects, fail as well. So here's our report card. Here's how Python is doing. I think I've identified some areas that we might need to, be, to work on. Um, I would say overall, we're somewhere around a B. Pretty solid B. You know, we're passing, we're doing okay, eh, but we could be doing a lot better. Um, and hopefully, um, you will join me in, in helping us do better. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jacob. Again, if you've got questions, please form an orderly rabble behind the two mics um, to get, get the room started again. Um, okay, so security's hard, let's go shopping. Um, there are many people out there who are then selling security audit services and security analysis services and whatnot. Um, but I'm also aware you've got people like Bruce Sterling who are out there saying security is a process, not a product. Are the security services worth the paper they're printed on or are they just a really wonderful way of exploiting public fear and doubt about things like this list and am I doing it properly and so on. Right. Well, let's, so let's leave, a, let's leave aside the snake oil, oil salesman, right? There are people out there selling security services who don't know what they're doing. Let's, let's leave them aside because, you know, scammer's going to scam, right? Let's assume we're talking about people who actually know what, know what they're doing, companies like Matasano that do, that do security audits and do penetration testing. Um, those are valuable in some cases. Uh, if you're getting ready to launch a product, and you've got something fixed, they can do a really good job because they can evaluate like a thing, right? You can think of it as like trying to break into a bank. The bank's not in the process of being constructed, it's there and, and it can be audited, it can be successfully looked at. So if you're, if you're getting ready to launch a product, you've got something concrete to be audited, um, these, firms, these firms can be worth their weight in gold. They can reveal stuff that you simply won't be able to, won't be able to find internally unless you've got these, these types of brains working for your company. Um, however, if you ask one of these firms to audit um, software that's in process, I mean, you, you'll get something, and you'll get something that you might be able to fix, but there's no telling that you'll, you won't just, you know, introduce something later on. So, um, in, and unfortunately, most web products are the latter, right? Like, most of what we build isn't is it done? You know, when was the last time you wrote a website? We're like, okay, done with that. Um, so yeah, I, I, unfortunately for most things that we develop, um, if you were to engage one of these companies, I would suggest you do it to have them help you come up with a security process. Uh, in the field, it's called an, an SDL, a secure development life cycle. Um, and these can be really heavyweight or they can be pretty lightweight, but they basically did give you some framework about thinking about your development process and how you apply it to security. And for most web developers, that's probably a better use of your, of your time and money is to look at it as a process. Hi. 
Hi, thanks for a really clear overview uh, of uh, what's available and what we should be doing. Uh, with regards to number four and your example with the application slash 6478 or whatever, um, when it comes to designing web apps, one of the thing that is, things that is super nice is having really nice URLs uh, that are, you know, meaningful. So is it enough to add, you know, login required to those types of views or should we still be having URLs that are kind of obfuscated or have a hash or something in them? It's, so it depends on your requirements, right? So if, if you're only really concerned about being able to see these job applications, um, for example, then, then login required will be enough. However, um, that will still leak a little bit of information. If I hit 1234 and get a 404, I know that that object doesn't exist. If I get a 401, I know that it does, but I'm not authorized. So you have to determine whether that's, you know, whether that's important, right? Like, do you care if I can determine the shape of your, you know, of your application? Are you do you not want people to know how rapidly your applications are being filled, for example? So that's, a, that's an application level concern. I would generally err on, on the side of not leaking information, sort of as a matter of principle, but sometimes it's not that big a deal. Um, in practice, do things like the same origin policy provide any uh, meaningful protection against CSRF attacks? No. <laughs> <laughs> There is um, uh, what's it called? Um, there's a new there's a new thing uh, around um, restricting. Oh, I can't remember, blanking on the name. What? No, that's cross origin stuff. No, there's a new there's a new thing about a, um, uh, a basically he some headers you can set that restrict what the browser is allowed to execute in terms of whether it can execute Java JavaScript only from what's that? CSP, thank you, yeah. Um, and as, there's this thing called CSP, which basically lets you determine a policy for your page that says you can only execute JavaScript if it's served from this particular page, and you can only load images from these domains, and you can kind of more restrict what the browser does. But this is, um, it's not widely supported just yet, um, and it's new enough that I, I, it sounds like a really good idea, but I don't know that it's, you know, we ha it's new enough that we haven't found the problems with it yet. Hi. Um, taint mode uh, is basically, for people that don't know, is basically marking things from certain sources as untrusted until they're found to be trusted. How do you feel about taint mode? Mm -hmm. Python doesn't currently have one. Uh, is that something that should be looked into? or? So I think the general consensus on taint mode is that it doesn't really work in practice. Um, it was really, there was a Perl taint mode many, many years ago, and I seem to recall it just being a massive pain in the butt. Um, that said, uh, I think that if I got to, if I got to like write Django over again, um, I would, there, I've, I've seen a couple of frameworks that require you to explicitly type every um, every bit of data that comes from the browser. So instead of saying, you know, request.post key, you say like request.post key as integer or as string or as, you know, username or something. And you actually have validation that in order to pull something out of request data, you actually have to validate it at that point. Um, uh, Simon came up with this idea, Simon Willison came up with this idea before Django was open source and we basically determined that it was too much work and we were lazy and I wish we had made the other, the other choice there. So I think that that's, that's probably a good middle ground between tainting, which can be really complicated and, and sort of hard to deal with and, uh, and just like, yeah, go to town. So that's what I'd like to do. Thank you. Yeah. Um, my question's about how um, if you have a login on a site, the whole site should be secure. Um, there's a, a setting for only doing uh, sessions on secure sites. Is that a valid way so you can have um, you know, a fast you know, public site with the back end secure? Or is that too much of a risk that you're going to leak information and actually a vulnerable, make your sessions vulnerable? So it, it can be done, right? You, you, it, you know, technically it is possible to have a site that is available, say, to anonymous users over HTTP and then make sure that once you're logged in, everything's SSL only. Um, the odds, the odds that an average developer will actually get that right, um, 
No judgment on your intellect, just based on historical data. Historical data says you will fail, right? Pa past results do not predict future performance. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's possible, but I, I would still, at this point, processors are powerful enough that the added cost of doing SSL termination and just making everything SSL, it feels to me, I would just rather pay that cost and not worry about this stuff. So the other way could be do a different domain. The other way around that could be a different domain for the SSL. Uh, well, yeah, you could do a different domain, but make sure it's actually a different TLD. You can't yeah. do like secure dot and unsecure dot because now you have <laughs> cookie issues and yeah. Okay, we've probably got time for two more questions, so one more from each mic. Okay. Um, you mentioned having uh, your packages not being able to tell which one of those are security updates and which of them are, and I was just wondering with the Python package index, whether there's, you got any thoughts about if there's anything that can be done there to say, hey, this is a security update. Yes, I have thoughts. <laughs> yeah, so um, there's been a lot of people thinking about this. There's a project right now called RubySec, which is trying to provide um, um, structured metadata around Ruby gems so that you can say, you know, um, you know, Rails 3. Dot whatever, whatever is a security release fixing a, a, a fixing CVE, whatever, which is severity, medium. And, it, and the bug was in these versions, like actually a lot of metadata. Um, and I think that the, there's this new um, uh, distutils, the, whatever, the new version of the distutils metadata has an extensions format. And I would, would think that we could kind of bung that information into the distutils metadata and then hopefully if PyPy exposes that metadata, we can then start to get at it. So I think that the, the tooling is starting to fall into place around this area. It's just not there yet. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, uh, you mentioned that Beaker for, uh, for Pyramid was insecure by default, which was really surprising. Oh, sorry. Uh, no, I, that, that was, I, I must have misspoken. Um, Pyramid has a built-in sessions tool, which is not Beaker. It's just built into Pyramid, uh, and yeah. that's insecure. Okay. Yeah, Beaker so is secure. Okay, yeah, pro probably my misinterpretation. Yeah, yeah. yeah it, that it was insecure by default was, was surprising. Across the board, Pyramid seemed really, wait, you, you did flag the fact that you weren't familiar with it. Uh, in your personal experience, have you shied away from Pyramid because of security considerations, or is this just you don't know about it? No, no, and I wouldn't. I, I, I don't want to give you the impression. Like, I, I think all of these frameworks do a really good job. The couple of places where I sort of called out Pyramid for missing things are, are in the scheme of things, pretty minor, right? Um, I think that all these frameworks do a really good job, and we all cross pollinate quite a bit. You know, um, uh, I would I would not make security a distinction, a, a reason to choose any framework. That the only reason I don't do that much with Pyramid is like I know Django really well. I also like Flask. That's like that's like two frameworks to keep in my mind. I don't need to like wedge a third one in there. But I I think Pyramid is great, and I would recommend anyone use it. There's nothing that would stop people from using it. Awesome. Thanks very much. Yeah. Okay, um, we've, we've run out of time, so if you do have additional questions, go and uh, track Jacob down yes, and uh, get him to ask uh, in the, uh, over, over lunch, which we're about to break for now, or um, over the course of the rest of the weekend. So everyone, thanks very much for Jacob. Cheers.